hello and uh, uh, welcome to our latest uh, Gastro Learning Live. Uh, I am really delighted uh, to uh, be talking uh, with, with my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Emma Culver, um, a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist from Oxford, about a topic that is very close to our hearts, uh, IgG4 related disease. Now, Emma, we have been passionately discussing IgG4 disease for, oh my goodness, nearly 15 years. Um, uh, and uh, we've now got to cover the whole of the topic in exactly 30 minutes. So this is a, a hell of a big ask, um, but um, uh, that's what we've uh, set, set to ourselves the task of doing. Um, uh, just, you know, looking back, when we first spoke about um, the IgG4 disease, we were really focused on the pancreas, weren't we? And we the, the, the historical terminology, of course, was autoimmune uh, pancreatitis. Um, things have um, changed and we now um, recognize that it's a much broader disease than that. Um, just as we get the, the, you know, a graphic up of, um, um, you know, IgG4 uh, disease, just tell us what you would define the disease as, you know, what, what, what brings various clinical problems into the, um, the envelope, if you like, of IgG4 disease. Yeah, George, I think you're right. You know, we used to think it was just in the pancreas and bile duct. And I think now we consider it very much to be a immune mediated fiber inflammatory multi-system disease. Um, and, and it's characterized very much by masses, really, um, or thickening or strictures or even nodules um, with a high serum IgG4 in the majority of patients. But this infiltration of lymphocytes, plasma cells, and fibrosis within the tissue with a predominant IgG4 infiltrate. So we know it's multi-system and it's fiber inflammatory. Um, and, and can I ask, you know, we're going to be focusing um, uh, on the, the sort of pancreatic and the biliary manifestations of IgG4 disease, but what would be your sort of... You, you, the, the the other disease sites that you would say we should be particularly looking out for? So I think now we kind of understand that there's probably 11, I almost say, disease sites that we really think about. And if I kind of go from the top to the 11? Bottom, think, 11. I mean, so, 11 is basically the whole of the body. No, it's not quite. So you can broadly divide it into four phenotypes. But I think, so I, let's say 11. So I'm going to say pachymeningitis. I'm going to say lacrimal glands and orbits salivary glands, thyroid, lungs. Looks like you're about to, you're going to need to stand on your chair. <laughs> and I'm going to keep going down. <laughs> and I'm going to go kidneys, pancreas bile duct, retroperitoneum aorta. And then I think broadly you can divide into four types. So you can say you've got the pancreatic biliary tree, you've got the retroperitoneum aorta, you've got the head and neck, and then lastly you've kind of got the systemic manifestations. Um, and, and you're right, pretty much every organ has been described to be involved in IgG4 disease. But I, but I think that these are the ones that we most frequently see in the clinic. But, but that's that's very interesting uh, because only over the last very few years have we started to compartmentalize the the, the disease types. Um, and does that help from a diagnostic point of view? So I think we like to put things in boxes, don't we? Um, and I guess it's more because this this is referred to so many different specialists. You know, it's not just a disease for you know, gastrohepatologists or pancreatologists. It's a disease for rheumatologists and hematologists and immunologists and orbital physicians and renal physicians. So I guess what it does help us to do is to be able to help to guide patients to say, a lot of the times this disease may only stay within this kind of area and that's what we're going to image and that's what we're going to look at. But there has been some nice data to say that the presentation determines actually what happens along the line, how you manage the patients and potentially their prognosis. So I think okay. that does actually help when you're defining them. Very interesting. So, I mean, we're going to be coming on to uh, to, to to management in a little while. Um, but let's let, let's just focus down a little bit on diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, particularly thinking about, um, well, let's start with pancreatic disease. You know, when when we first 
reported this uh, disease in the UK, we, you know, we thought, well, okay, if you've got a sausage pancreas and you've got a raised serum IgG4, then there you go, you've got the diagnosis. Um, is that, you know, what is good enough now in terms of um, making a definitive diagnosis? Yeah, so I think what I would say firstly, for the particularly for the pancreatic disease, is that he really presents a bit like a malignancy rather than acute pancreatitis. So what you tend to find is that patients will present with obstructive jaundice, weight loss with steatorrhea, um, an exocrine and endocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and very rarely or minimally abdominal pain. So I think that's the first thing to say is the differential is always malignancy there. And then you're right, out of all of the manifestations of IgG4 disease, actually the pancreas has probably got the most characteristic imaging. So a lot of patients will have this kind of sausage shaped pancreas and they have a pseudo capsule, so a rim around the outside. And then we see in the pancreatic duct, there's actually a sort of wavy pancreatic duct a lot of the time. Um, and, and there's a lack of upstream dilatation, but multiple strictures. And that differentiates it from other forms of pancreatitis and also thinking about other cancers. But not every patient has this perfect sausage shape with pseudo capsule. Um, and we do find that patients will have a focal mass in probably around about 40% of cases. And that doesn't have to just be at the head, but that's the most frequent. You can also feel it in the tail and elsewhere. And that makes it more difficult to diagnose. But would you agree that the, you know, we are very cautious about um, making a diagnosis of IgG4 related pancreatitis with a focal mass with upstream pancreatic duct dilatation and those patients particularly as the disease is often in you know middle-aged to elderly patients you know that is likely to be cancer until proven otherwise um Absolutely. and and what about um uh you know that corny phrase tissue is the issue you know do we um where do you think that sits in terms of the diagnosis of pancreatic IgG4 disease, and then we'll we'll move on in a minute to to biliary disease. But do yeah, you think I, we should be pushing for pathology to make a diagnosis of uh, IgG4 disease? So I think I think in those patients who have the really characteristic features I mentioned, the sausage, the pseudo capsule, irregular pancreatic duct with no concerning features, and they have a high serum IgG4 and other factors that would fit. I think that is probably your safest and th you know, the safest kind of presentation. But most patients don't present like that. And actually, those patients, you want to see some degree of multi-organ involvement, so maybe kidney disease or salivary gland disease to really make the diagnosis. And I think we're moving more and more into thinking about whether or not we would EUS and do a fine needle biopsy rather than aspirate um, in order to be able to get histology. And you can see on the slide in front of you, actually, there are very characteristic histological features that you can find. And you find this more frequently on reception specimens than you find in small biopsies, but characteristically that kind of lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate with those IgG4 cells, a very kind of store form or swirling fibrosis um, and the pleasant presence for blistered phlebitis are the things you're looking for in the biopsy to help lend to diagnosis and obviously exclude malignancy. Okay, brilliant. And, and we're going to move in a minute on to disease mimics, which you know, uh, are, are a particular consideration in, in, in this disease. But, but what about um, making a diagnosis of IgG4-related cholangitis? Mm -hmm. Because getting pathology in these patients can be, there's often not a lump, you know, there's diffuse biliary stricturing. Um, so we've got an um, example here of, of classification of um, IgG4 related cholangitis, and as we recognise, the 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 crucial differential diagnosis in these patients is uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis and cholangiocarcinoma. Um, do you have any tips or, or or views on how we should really be trying to push, you know, nail down this diagnosis? So, so I think I think they're really difficult questions. You're right, and. The, I think for patients with IgG4-related cholangitis, one of the things we find most frequently is the presence of pancreatic disease. So 80% you know, of patients will have pancreatic disease. So you're wanting to look to see if you've got a pancreatic head mass or a diffuse abnormality of the pancreas. 
particularly in that type one that's described, which is described in about 60 to 70% of patients, where you get a common bile duct stricture. And it's not just due to compression of the head of the pancreas, but also you get thickening of the actual wall of the bile duct as well. So I think for pancreatic disease is important. Um, and then you've got the kind of type two, which you nicely described again, it's a bit more PSC like, so you've got these intrahepatic duct abnormalities and there you want to try and distinguish between PSC and you're thinking very much of the kind of beading or irregularity that you often see in PSC that you wouldn't necessarily see in IgG4 sclerosing cholangitis, although it's quite difficult to depict the two. Um, you're also looking for evidence of other things that might support PSC. So the presence of ulcerative colitis, for example, that we know occurs in sort of 80% or at least some form of IBD. Um, and also you're thinking about obviously the serology, the serum IgG4 levels, which can be elevated in both, but are more frequently elevated to a much higher degree in patients who have IgG4 related disease. And then you've got the other two types that were there, the type three and type four, which are kind of isolated strictures. Type four probably being the hardest because of actually the hyla stricture is probably the most difficult to get to, to get any kind of sample from and distinguish yeah. from cancer. Yeah, and certainly we, um, you know, at, uh, at UCL are increasingly uh, you're using cholangioscopy yeah. to, I mean, I have to say not so much to make a visual diagnosis of IgG4 versus cholangio versus PSC, because I think it's incredibly difficult, but um, to really push for a uh, for, um, mucosal biopsy in this uh, setting. Can I just, let's, that, that, that takes us very nicely in a way on to disease mimics. Mm -hmm. um, and let's start with the biliary tree. Um, you mentioned, um, as we all know, about 80% of patients with PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, will have histological evidence of colitis. Um, do you think that the presence of inflammatory bowel disease essentially excludes the diagnosis of IgG4-related cholangitis? Yeah, that's a really tough one. So we know historically in looking at all our kind of autoimmune pancreatitis cohorts and more recently our IgG4 cohorts have also got pancreatitis is multi-system. Probably about 5% of patients still have inflammatory bowel disease, even when they've had a Whipple's resection and definitely have autoimmune pancreatitis. So I think the danger lies in those patients who've just got biliary disease. And in the new classification criteria that have been created, actually, it's an exclusion to have a patient who's got mm. biliary disease and has presence of colitis because it's much more likely to be PSE with colitis than it ever is to be IgG4 sclerosing cholangitis with colitis. Um, I think that said, those patients who have had colitis with autoimmune pancreatitis and systemic manifestations have had very much an indeterminate colitis with often lots of IgG4 cells in the colon. So I don't think it completely excludes it, but it puts your markers up that says, actually, this is probably going to be PSE much more likely than it is to be um, IgG4 sclerosing cholangitis, particularly in the absence of any pancreatic disease or other organ involvement. OK, great. And then uh, 10 or maybe 15 years ago now, um, the, the Mayo Group came out with the interesting observations about high levels of serum IgG4 in patients with PSC mm -hmm. and suggesting that those patients had, in fact, a more rapidly progressive biliary disease. Where are we at with IgG4 positive PSC? Is it an overlap disease? Is it uh, just a, you know, a, a, a phenomenon related to an increase in inflammatory phase of PSC? or are they similar type diseases or in fact the same disease? Yeah, George, that's a really hard one again. Um, I think we are much further forward, but I think a lot of studies will contradict each other. So there are a number of studies, a nice study suggesting that it's associated with a more severe phenotype, for whatever reason that might be, um, both in terms of uh, progression to transplant and also in theory, um, an increased risk of having more active colitis and severity. Um, however, um, some of the more recent data looking at the PSC trials and a particular clinical trial looking at PSC didn't really find that in the large prospective studies with a clinical trial that the IgG4 made any difference in terms of outcome in the longer term. So what I would say is when I see a patient who's got PSC and high IgG4, I mean, firstly, the, the level of the IgG4 probably does matter. 
And if you're looking at an IgG4 level of four times the upper limit of normal, you want to be hunting pretty hard to make sure they haven't got any of those features of systemic disease. And I would advocate doing a proper CT chest abdo pelvis or even considering a PET scan and thinking about is there another area that could possibly um, be involved that suggests this could be IgG4 related rather than just PSC? Because most of those patients have a, a serum IgG4, which is much lower. Um, uh, and and we, will, we will come on to treatment in a little bit, but as we know, the, the medical treatment of PSC remains frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, in your practice, you know, if you have a patient with a raised serum IgG4, uh, it, with a diagnosis of PSC and a, an IgG4 of four times the upper limits of normal, let's say, um, where does your discussion go with regards to a trial of um, steroids, for example? Yeah, so we, we, so we hunt first. So I would say that I would hunt first, really actively looking for any other signs of organ involvement. And then actually quite a low threshold to biopsy as well, um, not based on the serum IgG4 alone, but actually looking in the tissue. And I think if you've got a kind of inflammatory overlap in the tissue, in addition to the fact that you've got an elevated serum IgG4 with or without other organ involvement, I think there is a reason there for thinking about giving a steroid trial. Um, mm -hmm. And we have given steroid trials in that kind of context, but in a very kind of safe environment. So in other words, in patients who are not cirrhotic um, with advanced risk of infection, and also after imaging them at the beginning and also imaging around four to six weeks later to see if there's been any change in their strictures and stopping the steroids if there hasn't been. Um, right. Because I think, again, giving um, immunosuppressants for a long period of time, particularly in PSE patients, it's been never shown as a good way of treating them. And more importantly, it opens them up to increased infections unless they have inflammatory bowel disease and they need it for that. Okay, great, excellent. Um, you mentioned imaging, um, PET scans. Yeah. Um, do, you know, in, in, our, in our, you know, joint super regional uh, MDT, of which we've got a course again tomorrow morning, um, <laughs> uh, where I think it's fair to say we're increasingly using PET scan PET scanning, where do you think it sits in terms of uh, the initial diagnosis? I think it's probably overkill for the initial diagnosis. I think you can get away with doing uh, a CT chest abdo pelvis with contrast and then examining the neck um, in, at, the, at the start of you know, the diagnostic um, pathway. And then obviously, if you have biliary disease, you probably want an MRCP, the bile ducts. And actually, sometimes for glandular disease, you might want an ultrasound or an MRI of the neck. Um, I think PET scan, the, the value of PET scan for me is if you've got subclinical disease that's active and you want to confirm why that IgG4 remains really high despite treatment. Um, if you want to find an area to biopsy and you haven't necessarily seen it on your full scan. Um, and also for disease activity going forward. So again, if you can't explain why there's ongoing symptoms or ongoing active inflammation markers then going back to the PET CT is really helpful there. Okay and and you you mentioned its potential role in assessing disease activity uh much quicker much cheaper is doing serum IgG4. Yeah. Where where are we at with I mean certainly we we you you mentioned about um you know misdiagnosis and certainly something that we've all seen over the particularly the last few years is the patient who has acute pancreatitis um, and somebody's re me measured an IgG4 that is high and then people have put two and two together and said this is autoimmune pancreatitis and it almost never is but do you where do you see serum IgG4 in terms of um, assessing disease activity do you think it's and therefore perhaps predicting relapse do you think it has any role yeah, I, I actually really like IgG4 in that context. I think you're right. As a diagnostic marker, it, it, there's no absolutes. 20 to 30% will have a normal level, despite the fact they've got IgG4 disease, and 10 to 20% of other inflammatory, infective, um, and even cancerous conditions can have a high IgG4. So, you know, it's not ideal for diagnosis, which is why you can't use it in isolation, even though it's part of a, you know, a, a group of things you can lose. But I think in terms of monitoring, if it's up at the beginning and it starts to go down with treatment, which is what you usually see um, with steroids and immunosuppressives, I actually think rises in serum IgG4 alongside, I often use a serum IgE in complement levels, particularly again, if they're abnormal at the beginning, are a nice way of being able to track disease activity and, and use as biomarkers. And I often think that the serum IgG4 will rise before you see anything clinically or in terms you see anything on imaging. So it gives me advance notice that something is brewing and something's going to happen. 
but I don't just treat the IgG4. So okay. if the IgG4 goes up, I don't just give them more steroids. I, I, it's a marker for me to ask them questions, to look for any evidence of active disease. And sometimes patients will have a high IgG4 and they retain a high IgG4, but there's no signs of organ abnormality. And at, that, at this stage, I don't think we have the evidence to say we should treat those patients um, with immunosuppression based on their IgG4. Okay, brilliant, fantastic. Um, let's talk about treatment. Now in the good old days or the bad old days, depending on how you look at it, we used to give everybody a course of steroids, particularly as the focus was autoimmune pancreatitis uh, generally. We used to give everybody a course of steroids. The great majority, well, everybody practically who had the correct diagnosis got wonderfully better. And then we stopped the steroids and, you know, waited for them to relapse and then uh, then usually reintroduced steroids and gave some azathioprine. Um, that's, um, that's pretty 2005. Um, <laughs> Do you, two questions really, do you think there remains a role for um, single agent steroids in IgG4 disease? And um, in particular, what should be the, 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 the sort of induction treatment for, um, for, for IgG4 disease? Yeah, again, again, tough questions. So I, what I would say is that steroids, are still very good uh, for diagnosis because we know that 97, 98% of patients will respond to corticosteroids. And now as part of the classification criteria, if you don't respond, you're thinking of another disease. So I think it's quite good as a sort of diagno for diagnosis. And also it gets rid of symptoms really quickly within a matter of days to short weeks. And you see liver function tests and inflammatory markers get better. And even if you're going to go ahead and give an immunosuppression, um, such as azathioprine mycophenolate, it takes a lot longer, that's much more maintenance. And even B-cell therapy, you're talking about weeks. So I think the immediacy for steroids is great. And also as a diagnostic kind of confirmation, I think, think is good. The problem is with the pancreatic patients is 50% of them have diabetes at the start. And they're often older men and they have lots of comorbidities. And so we see lots of side effects for steroids, particularly worsening of diabetes. And that's really difficult to deal with. Um, and the characteristic regime has always been 30 to 40 milligrams for two to four weeks, and then tapering by five milligrams every couple of weeks, uh, acknowledging that actually, if you're going to flare, you're usually flaring at sort of 10 milligrams or lower. Um, and that would be the time of flaring. And then historically, as you say, we used to add in the azathioprine. I think for those patients who've just got single organ disease, actually, you don't necessarily have to top down approach. You know, you could think about this as something that you might be able to treat the corticosteroids. And I, and, and I just... One. When you say single organ disease, do you mean pancreas or any single organ disease? In other words? Um, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Again, I, I think pancreas particularly, but actually also just, just salivary glands, for example. However, yeah. although we find the salivary glands probably do recur, um, we, we quote around about 50 to 60 percent chance of recurrence. Um, and I think that that increases over years. So it's probably around about 30 percent in the first six months, about 50 to 60 percent by a year and probably closer to 80 percent by about three years so i think over time the chance of recurrence is quite high but those patients have got a normal serum igg4 have just pancreatic disease and what we haven't touched on is the type 2 pancreatitis here so we do know that patients who have inflammatory bowel disease um, may develop a type 2 autoimmune pancreatitis that have got granulocytic epithelial lesions and neutrophils and those patients respond really well to steroids. They look very much like type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis. Um, and actually, they very rarely recur. So those patients, kind of, you can get rid of their pancreatitis really quickly. Um, and so I think in those patients, you might want to consider single agent disease, single organ disease. Um, I guess the other thing you want to think about is damage. And if whether or not giving immunosuppression for a longer period of time can reverse either the endocrine or exocrine insufficiency that you get with, with this condition. And, and in the patient, for example, let us say, has, has got multi-organ disease, let's say biliary disease, um, we're going to want more than just a single course of steroids in those. Um, the, the, there's a move perhaps a, towards mycophenolate and, and, and away from azathioprine. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Based on evidence that, as much then. That, yeah, that, that's, very, that's very much based on randomized data. Um, there's very few randomized trials and no double blind trials in this condition, um, which is why we need novel therapies. But the ones that have been done have been done in Asia on mycophenolate and leflunamide. 
Um, and mycophenolate is given alongside steroids to try and reduce the risk of relapse compared to steroids alone. Um, small cohort of sort of 65 patients, but still reproducibly it showed that actually you could reduce your relapse rate by giving a combination. And we see that very much in clinical practice. Um, and it reduces a lot of the proliferation of the B cells. And we believe that actually that kind of helps to kind of hold the disease. So I feel that mycophenolate is holding a lot more of our systemic patients a lot well, but better than azathioprine. Um, and we have changed definitely over time. And, okay. and again, to address your other question, I think, again, there was lots of patients who will have a high risk of relapse, the multi-organ disease, the proximal biliary strictures, those that present with a high IgG4 at the beginning, those with retroperitoneal fibrosis. And I think we should be moving there to starting sort of slightly more top down and saying, let's give a DMARD alongside a um, steroid course at the very beginning, because we don't really want them to relapse and, and damage further. Um, and there's some nice meta-analysis data to suggest that that's actually the right thing to do. Okay, and, and um, there's some good questions coming uh, coming through. We've not got a huge amount of time, but um, um, what about eosinophilic in infiltrates and the, and peripheral eosinophilia? Do you think, in terms of making a diagnosis, that that's part of uh, uh, yeah. that's part of IgG four? Yeah, I, I think that sits with the IgE actually. So we know about forty percent of patients will have some form of atopy, particularly asthma, so um, eosinophilic asthma as well. Um, so they will have atopy and allergy. And we do feel, see that we have a low level peripheral eosinophilia alongside their elevated IgE and the elevated IgG4. I mean, obviously okay. you have to exclude other causes of high eosinophils, including kind of drugs and eosinophilic vasculitis, and even Shirk strauss which can be a mimic of IgG4. Um, but I think a low level peripheral blood eosinophilia is useful. Okay, great. Let's flip back to treatment again. I slightly stopped you. Um, Third line, standard third line treatment is rituximab. Um, just say a little bit more. I mean, rheumatologists might look at us giving, you know, steroids and uh, uh, and mycophenolate and, and, you know, think that we're, you know, 20 years behind the game. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, talk us about the, the use in the UK of rituximab and, and, and the, um, and then we'll we'll have a few words about um, uh, you know exciting future treatments for IgG4. Yeah, so so I think um, in terms of access in the UK, we can only get rituximab third line, which means patients have had to have steroids and another DMARs and either failed them or been intolerant before we can have access to rituximab. But there's well over sixty patients now through the MDT who've received rituximab and done very well on it. Um, I guess you're completely right within Europe and elsewhere where you have easier access to rituximab, actually you would consider using it a lot earlier on. Um, I think it's difficult to advocate it as first line therapy um, unless you have high features of relapse at the start. And again, that will be multi-organ disease. When I say a high IgG4, I mean a serum IgG4 greater than four times the upper limit of normal, although a lot of studies use greater than two times the upper limit of normal as their cutoff. Um, and we also have seen patients with high IgE and eosinophilia actually as markers of bad response over time to rituximab and having to think about escalating therapy further. So I think they're all markers that you need to look at from the start. Okay, brilliant. And um, let's, in the final, or oh, literally last couple of minutes, let's just think about the future in terms of uh, uh, treatment. Um, clearly rituximab was the initial, uh, the main sort of B cell depleting agent that that seems to show promise. Where, where do you see the, the, the direction of travel um, over the next 10 years in terms of uh, therapies for, um, for IgG4 disease? I, th I think as we, we know more about pathogenesis, we've realized that actually we've moved from a kind of blunderbuss approach to much more targeting of specific cell sets, particularly B cells and the, C, the T cells that interact with them. So current clinical trials that are, that are open or opening include that of inebolizumab, which is an anti-CD19 uh, agent, which is currently open as the Mitigate trial, um, open in 80 different centers across the world. Um, and that's a randomized control trial of, of active and relapsing IgG4 patients. And then um, due to open soon here and also in other centers is one of obeleximab, again, which targets a slightly different agent. It's looking at plasma cells, B cells, and F2 gamma B receptors. It's had good phase two data. Um, uh, slightly differently, um, inebolizumab is given intravenously, um, obeleximab is given as a subcut infusion. And then there are other trials that are opening, looking at, um, looking at, I suppose, different ways of targeting both the B and T cells, which includes BTK inhibitors that are given orally, 
to in phase two, a data set that's recently been published, again, phase two data targeting the CTLA-4 um, and the FC gamma receptors, and then actually targeting these cytotoxic T cells that are thought to be really involved in crucial in pathogenesis, which is elatuzumab, which is a SLAMF7 target. So all of these different molecules are thought to be potentially involved in the pathogenesis of the disease. And so by taking out different molecules or taking out uh, different cells, we're hoping to actually sort of change the thing that's actually driving, maybe not initiating, but driving the ongoing inflammation and also the fibrosis. And I think, you know, we have to watch this space because eventually we may indeed get top-down therapies. And once we can choose which patients to give them to, those high relapsing patients, we can start to target in a way we do actually for IBD and other rheumatological conditions, um, who we actually give these, these therapies for. Fantastic. Wow. Um, and I mean, it's, it, you know, as we said at the beginning, uh, 15 years ago, this was not a disease that was recognized in, uh, um, you know, in the, 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 the UK. And, you know, and, you know, at that time, it was a case of just recognizing the patients. And mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's actually a very considerable change that now in 2023, we're really looking to target the you know the the immunopathogenesis of uh, of the disease. So, uh, and you, of course, Emma, have been you know absolutely and remain absolutely central in in all of those areas. So we've come to the end. Um, it's been a, a you know great fun, huge pleasure, um, and I hope very useful for um, you know our attendees to find out in thirty minutes uh, a huge amount that we need to know about IgG four related disease. So. Uh, Can I just um, say, George, two, two take home messages for me. I just yep. want to say one, you know, really work hard to get that diagnosis right before you get yep. lots of corticosteroids. And two, you know, steroid stewardship in this kind of day and age, we need to be careful who we're just giving steroids to and not kind of monitoring them in the long term. So for me, they're the two big things I think that we've got to do going forward. Great, great take home messages. Um, good. You. We've come. Oh, we've 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 hit the bell, I'm afraid. <laughs> so um, thanks, Emma, ever so much. And um, I will see you bright and early tomorrow morning for the IGG4 MDM.